because to, to get the maximum benefit for Georgia, for business and for families, you really want to be able to help those who are the most vulnerable and the most at the margins, and really, frankly, the most at risk of dropping out of the workforce entirely. So that's where the refundable piece is important. I've had at least two hearings on the legislation in the Senate Finance Committee. And I think that there is some support for um, moving forward with an EITC. Of course, it does cost the state coffers a little bit of money. How much depends on how, what the match percentage would be to the federal EITC, um, and therefore how much money Georgia families would, would receive. And of course, anything that costs the state coffers any money, well, I shouldn't say anything, uh, that, that is outside the priorities of certain folks in charge, um, usually doesn't necessarily rush through. So, uh, we haven't passed it yet, but I do sense strong interest in it. And the Senate Finance Committee Chairman, um, Senator Chuck Abstration, not Chuck Abstration, I was just on a call from him. Chuck Stetler from Rome is actually quite supportive of the legislation. Thank you, Senator. And apologies about the outside yard work of my apartment. Um, Danny, I'm gonna hand it over to you to let us know where the bills are right now and what opportunities there are for this upcoming legislative session for those to move. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Rachel. And, and, and thanks to Senator Parent and Representative Lim for, for their strong leadership uh, on this issue in the General Assembly. And so right now we are already in a very different posture uh, from where the state was fiscally in, in the last part of the legislative session. So we have received uh, the first half of our $4.7 billion in relief funding under the American Rescue Plan. And actually in part because of the large budget cuts that the state has been making since the pandemic hit, we ran a very large surplus uh, in, in the 2021 year uh, where the state raised significantly more money than we spent. And, and part of that was because of federal increases and in unemployment insurance payments, a host of interventions. But the bottom line is that now as a state, uh, all indications are that we have filled up our reserves to the maximum level uh, allowable, about 15% uh, of, of our state budget, essentially. And so that leaves the decision of how to appropriate that, that surplus funding, uh, how to use those American Rescue Plan dollars, uh, which can be used in the short term for direct payments uh, that would operate the exact same way as a refundable EITC. So essentially, you know, the governor could next week authorize that, authorize those payments to go out uh, to the 1 million families and now 600,000 uh, others in the workforce who qualify for the ITC. Um, and, and that could be done uh, if the governor chooses to, to allow the General Assembly to have input over appropriating those dollars. Uh, right now, that's with the governor's office. But otherwise, either of these bills could be passed through uh, the legislative process. And so I'll also note that there's another bill, House Bill 510, which is a non-refundable version uh, that otherwise looks the same uh, as, as the, the legislation that uh, Senator Parent and Representative Lim have put forward. Uh, and that's sponsored by uh, Representative Houston Gaines, as well as several other uh, Republican committee chairs. And so that's just one indication that there is bipartisan support. Um, but I just wanna you know, close that with saying that you know, there's already talk about another income tax cut coming up next, next legislative session. And this would be the, the form of income tax cut that would be most beneficial right now. It would help about half of those who are under uh, essentially the middle income in the state uh, who need that boost the most. And, and, and those dollars also will go right back into our economy. Now, you know, that's compared to a, a, a top income tax cut uh, of the rate that would only benefit very few Georgians and could uh, really harm us in the long term. So that is kind of the, the different choice that we're going to be facing in the next legislative session is how to use those funds most responsibly. Uh, and, and, and we would certainly encourage the state to look at an EITC uh, to do that. 
Thank you, Danny, and thank you, Representative Lim and um, Senator Parent. So we're gonna go into our first moderated discussion question. Um, I'll preface saying that according to small business majority polling, nearly six in 10 Georgia small businesses support establishing a state EITC program for low income employees and self-employed business owners modeled um, as we mentioned just a second ago on the federal EITC program. Furthermore, the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute recently released a poll highlighting provisions in the American Rescue Plan, which states that 33% of Georgians strongly support using American Rescue Plan dollars to create a state level earned income tax credit for Georgia. My question to you all is, do you believe that Georgia could be doing more to help level the playing field for small businesses? And I'll let whoever would like to go first. I can start. Go ahead. Georgia absolutely can do more to help level the playing field. The prime example I keep pointing to is the many small businesses in my district. Most of them are minority or immigrant owned. I think of the restaurants along Jimmy Carter Boulevard, to which I certainly invite anyone who wishes to come. They, like many small businesses in Georgia, were shut out of SBA COVID-19 relief for a variety of reasons. Now, obviously that was a federal program, but the reasons they were shut out and the reason that the larger businesses infamously got a lot of that relief is pretty universal and speaks to how unlevel the playing field really is. There's a lack of access by small businesses to everything in terms of aid, grants, loan, capital, to technical assistance, to enforcement mechanisms. And then there's just the simple matter of unfair competition, you know, larger corporations driving out small businesses and ultimately hurting the free market and the price point for consumers across every industry. This is a free market issue. And I would point to one industry that's actually far outside of mine and Senator Parent's district that Actually, you can most clearly see that in, and that is agriculture. I'm actually on two committees, one on construction costs, the other on raw milk that have taken field trips this summer. And we've heard pleas from small timberland owners, small dairy farmers, and many other of these small ag businesses to help them. And it's interesting because in theory, we should and do agree across the aisle, across industries that small businesses are the backbone to our economy. But it, when it comes time to actually doing something for them, I don't know. Um, and I think a lot can be done. That's why I introduced another bill for which I was grateful for small business majority support that attempted to allow businesses to sue under the state's Fair Business Practices Act that at least got a hearing. But even if you think that's a large lift, there are smaller ones. I think the EITC is a smaller lift. There are even simpler things like expending ARP funds to uh, fund more places like UGA Small Business Development Center, some of the smaller chambers. Because again, we can all theoretically agree that small businesses are important across the aisle, across industries, but we can certainly do a lot more to live that out. Thank you, Representative. Yeah, I I, um, I definitely agree with everything that Representative Lynn said. And, you know, it's kind of this circular problem where the businesses and industries that are already larger have more resources to put back into influencing public policy and influencing legislation and um, providing elected representatives with campaign contributions and hiring very expensive, well-connected lobbyists to advance their interests. And we see that, of course, across all levels of government. So it is much more of a struggle um, for small businesses to break through with their needs. And that's why it's critical for organizations like Small Business Majority for, for people to band together to try to advance a singular agenda, but direct advocacy by small businesses and small business owners is critical because that's the only way to counter the um, magnitude of resources that like the large industries are gonna be able to bring to bear on the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Danny, did you have anything? If not, I'll go on to the more tax related questions. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would just very briefly echo uh, echo what was said by both the Senator and, and, and Representative, uh, and, and then just say that right now, the way that the tax code ba is balanced is completely in favor of the largest corporations. And so we are set to give out $10 billion uh, in, in loopholes and incentives and tax breaks 
over this next year. And the vast majority of that is going to go out of state uh, to shareholders of multinational corporations, uh, because that, that is where the greatest benefits are going. And so we can rebalance that system. Uh, and, and it starts with things like an EITC uh, that, that's going to put money back into local economies, uh, small business owners, and, and give those uh, who are struggling the most an opportunity uh, to, to get on their feet. Thank you, Danny. Um, to continue the tax conversation, before this year, the federal tax code um, taxed low-wage childless workers into poverty and deeper poverty. The American Rescue Plan addressed this problem by roughly tripling the EITC for childless workers, benefiting 17 million low-wage workers, many of whom are essential workers. And we've seen how crucial these workers are, especially during the pandemic. Um, these include those cashiers, cooks, delivery drivers, food preparation workers, and especially those child care providers providers. Um, for example, a childless worker who works 30 hours per week at $9 per hour earns income that after taxes leaves them below the federal poverty line. By increasing the worker's EITC to more than $1,100, this EITC expansion helps pull such workers out of poverty. Um, the next question was, do you believe current tax systems provide opportunities for all small business owners to grow and thrive? And I think we kind of highlighted that on the, the recent discussion we just had, but the next question is, how would you describe the long-term benefits of an EITC for working families and children? I'll jump in real quick. Um, there's actually a ton of data on the benefits of EITC. This is actually a really broad question, so I'll just mention a couple things real quick, and I will probably come up come back around to some of the some of the other points that that could be included in this answer. But there's actually a lot of data. Um, to support the notion that EITC creates for healthier children and healthier families. Um, I pulled out some of these studies in preparation for the call. As a matter of fact, the, um, the Texas, uh, the University of Texas at Austin has a prenatal to three policy impact center. And one of the um, analysts there reached out when she saw that I had filed Senate Bill 58 and said, um, based on comprehensive reviews of the most rigorous evidence, we have identified that a state EITC is one of the five most effective solutions a state can implement to make sure children get off to a healthy start and thrive. Studies show that states with refundable EITCs have lower poverty rates, a higher likelihood of mother's employment, and increased birth weights. There's also data showing that children and families with uh, EITCs do better in school, um, and the families are obviously more economically stable. So it really makes sense when you think about it. If economic stability, um, economic stability in and of itself is the foundation to provide all those things that I just mentioned, including you know, less um, transiency, right? So if you've got less transiency because families are more stable and can afford to stay in housing, then you're gonna have kids do better in school. You're going to have more money available for healthy food, which is going to be requisite for health of children and parents, as well as um, doing well in school. So these benefits then just build upon each other in critical ways. So I'll let others jump in, but that's just a few of the things that we see uh, well proven in research that are benefits of an EITC. Oh. Absolutely. And I would add to that, that I, I love the data, Senator Parents good with data. There are, speaking of data, there are also several studies that have now shown that the stimulus at the federal level and other programs like expanded unemployment temporarily lifted people out of poverty. And that's huge. But your question was about the long-term benefits. So in the long-term world where we don't necessarily have guaranteed jobs or income or an expanded unemployment program, EITC would help get people back to work, actually keep them in work and not drive them out, and actually better enable them to get them and their families out of poverty, not just for a year or two years, but beyond that. And that's very personal, particularly to people in my district, because another data point is actually about 25% of the people, people, not households in my district, were at or below federal poverty levels. And that's per the 2019 American Community Survey. So that's pre-COVID. But COVID certainly isn't bringing that down. I've been looking at data because I'm trying to ensure that 
We will continue to be a state opportunity zone, a federal new market tax credit zone. So per preliminary data, I can say that that is going to be the same. And yet per that 2019 data, of that group of people, that 25% I mentioned that were in the workforce, so you take kids out of it, a full 80% of those people were designated as employed, but they're in poverty. So how can that be? Well, obviously that means they're underemployed and being underemployed and struggling with so much as someone who myself grew up as an immigrant on public assistance and was surrounded by that group of people, I can attest to the fact that it's very difficult with without a lot of luck, and I was fortunate to have that, but not others, uh, to go up from there. I think a state EITC will only help those who are struggling to serve their families, to help them in the long term get out of poverty and not just be further driven out of the workforce and further into poverty. Yeah, and and, and you know, I, I I would echo all of that, and then also co correct another myth, which is that people in living, you know, there, there, there's a, a notion out there that people who are living in poverty don't pay a lot in taxes. And, and that's actually not true. If we look at the state and local level, uh, those who are earning the least actually pay the, the greatest amount in terms of a share of their income in state and local taxes. Uh, and, and so from, from the numbers that we have, that's about 10% uh, for, for those who were living under the poverty level. Uh, and, and that is about 30% more uh, in, in terms of share of income than those at the very top are paying. So refundable tax credits like an EITC are, are the only way to really correct for uh, those regressive sales tax and, and property taxes uh, and, and payroll taxes that are really cannibalizing a lot of uh, income for those at, at, at the lowest levels. So um, actually, you know, when, when, when we look on net, they are still contributing uh, a, a really sh large share of their income uh, to, to taxes. And then, you know, when, when we invest in an EITC, we also find a really strong economic multiplier. And so that's why, you know, cities and counties and small businesses across the state uh, also see those effects in a really uh, significant way that does actually contribute uh, to, to the growth of our economy because those dollars uh, are, are going back into Georgia and, and back into our local communities. Thank you, Danny. Would you all go as far to say that a state EITC will help close those tax gaps? Will this be an effective anti-poverty program? A hundred percent. Danny, you want to, you're, you're our tax guy. Absolutely. And so, you know, starting out at a 10% refundable EITC uh, means about $500 uh, for, for those families. And so we can always continue to increase that. Uh, refundability is definitely a key element to be able to reach those who are struggling the most, uh, to be able to avoid, you know, one of the things about the EITC and pegging it to the federal level is that we avoid some of those really low benefits cliffs uh, that, that cause folks at, at the margins of the poverty level uh, to struggle against losing a lot of their benefits. Uh, if, if they do go up in the workforce and earn more money, the EITC helps to avoid that up until about the median income, uh, which, which as Representative Lim said, is, is, is in the 50,000s, uh, about, about 55,000 is, is the average uh, median that, that Georgians are making. Uh, and so, you know, the, the EITC is a really powerful tool in doing that. We can always increase it, but right now, unfortunately, at the state level, uh, we, we really are doing very little for, for working people uh, and, and, and even less for uh, families through the tax system. And so uh, we, we could be doing a lot more. Uh, this is a tool that has been proven at the federal level uh, to be essentially the, the largest anti-poverty uh, measure since social security was enacted. Uh, so uh, by mirroring that at the state level, we can keep investing more and more resources into the backbone of our state. Um, and, and certainly the EITC will allow us to do that. Thanks, Danny. Let's see. We've talked about small business owners. How do you all think employees would benefit from a state EITC? Should they be as equally invested in supporting this addition as their employers? Well, I'll jump in real quick. I feel like we've actually spent a little more time on the benefits for individuals than for business. And um, I think it's really critical to note that having the EITC 
puts more money into the economy. So it's especially important for small businesses who are going to be relying on um, numbers of local local residents to be able to, to patronize their businesses and buy their goods. And so by having the EITC, that is because these families are don't have tons and tons of disposable income, what they receive, they are mostly going to be spending. And so small businesses will by and large be the beneficiaries of uh, that money. And we haven't yet uh, talked about the fact that the vast majority of states now have a local EITC, so uh, or a state a state level EITC, and so by not having one in Georgia, that puts our small businesses at a disadvantage, our local small businesses at a disadvantage, um, compared to small businesses in all of those other states. Uh, my notes say that there are <clears throat> twenty nine or thirty other states that have already implemented a state level EITC. I don't know if those numbers have changed recently, but I'm sure Danny could tell us if that's the case. Yeah, I would I would absolutely agree with that, of course. And I think ultimately employers and employees should be equally invested. On the employer side, I mean, we've heard employers for months now lament about their inability to attract and retain workers in this climate. I've had that conversation mm -hmm. repeatedly from my first meeting months ago with Labor Commissioner Mark Butler to the Georgia Chamber, many other small chambers, to many small businesses from, again, across the industry, agriculture, food and beverage, to, I have to mention, manufacturing, because we, in my district, have the third largest hub of manufacturing in the Southeast. We've heard this complaint over and over again, and we have seen that even though unemployment benefits ended, because a lot of folks thought that was the culprit, people are still not going back to the workforce. This EITC actually incentivizes that. So I think employers, particularly those smaller businesses that aren't able to compete with, necessarily compete with higher wages or these great uh, educational benefits, they absolutely should be invested in that. And certainly from the employee side, to the extent that it's an incentive to work for those who have to work, particularly in those hardest labor conditions, this would benefit them. Um, something that I, again, take personally in my district where over 40% of the people uh, in the workforce don't have health care. Well, this would enable them to provide some money for, for that purpose. So certainly on the employee side, because the reality is in this climate, a lot of people can't necessarily go back into work in, in the safest way for the foreseeable future. And yet they have to for their families. They should absolutely be invested in this because it at least provides them something that would enable them to, to offset any costs that come with doing so. Thank you, Representative Lim. Um, so the majority of small businesses in Georgia are solo enterprises, right? The median income for those self-employed individuals, as Danny mentioned, um, is around that $50,000 range. Um, that's from 2018 that I have. Um, for self-employed individuals at their own unincorporated firms, median income was only $25,064. Um, and Danny, you can start here, but do you think that changing the top income tax rates or closing ta uh, corporate tax loopholes would essentially harm small businesses? No, no, absolutely not. I mean, I think as the, the best thing that we can do in the long term is reform what right now is a, is a really antiquated income tax system uh, that that where, where our brackets date back to the mid 1930s essentially, and and so they operate very flatly, uh, which means that that the lowest income people are paying a greater proportion of what they earn in in taxes uh, than, than they need to be. And also, what we've seen is a dramatic rise in tax credits and loopholes for those at the very top, and so that puts more pressure on everyone else uh, to pay. 
uh, you know, different fines and fees and, 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 and all kinds of things uh, so that we can make up for that regressivity in our tax system while also having uh, really narrow social services, you know, not spending enough money in education, healthcare, and those things that are going to drive our economy and allow us to be competitive. And so, you know, what we've heard from both Senator Parent and Representative Lim is why the earned income tax credit is, you know, a small business issue and a healthcare issue, education, childcare. It relates to all of those things uh, because it's a very powerful tool to put more money in the pockets of those who need it the most uh, and to be able to do it in a balanced way that, that allows our entire state economy to rise. And so as part of that, you know, we should look at those reforms closing those loopholes, you know, looking at uh, tax credits that are going 75% to uh, multinational companies that are going out of state to corporate shareholders. You know, we, we don't need those tax credits uh, to be economically competitive, but if we turn around and use that revenue to invest in healthcare education and things like an EITC that actually will put more money in the pockets of those who live here, that is going to have a much greater effect on our economy, uh, on small businesses, on you know, sole proprietors, uh, really the vast majority of people uh, in our state as a whole. And so uh, the, you know, we, we have gone in, in, in a very different direction where since the Great Recession, essentially, we've seen those tax credits rise fivefold you know, all from, from a, a, about $2 billion, all uh, over $10 billion, when, when we're on a $26 billion budget, you know, if, if, if the film tax credit were a state agency, uh, it would be in the top 10, it would be larger than the Department of Human Services now, uh, which, which just tells you that, that we are not prioritizing uh, some of those core areas of government as, as much as we could. Uh, so, so certainly those reforms uh, would, would benefit the state as a whole. Thank you, Danny. Yeah, I would just add to that that you know one one of your early questions, late Rachel, was that will the state ITC help close the tax gaps? It absolutely will. It won't close it all the way, of course, without addressing the top income tax rates and closing those corporate tax loopholes. I think doing so would only hurt, uh, excuse me, help small businesses to the extent that, again, both the income tax rate at the highest, as well as particularly those corporate tax loopholes, they are creating anti-competitive practices. Again, this is a matter of truly free market, but these are what are harming small businesses. And we can and should do everything to help laborers, particularly those of the lowest income, we should do everything to help directly small businesses, but without also directly tackling what are essentially creating monopolistic domination by some of the larger corporations, we can only go so far. So it really is of the same piece. You need to be able to, and you need to do both. Thank you, Representative. Um, we're gonna be coming up on our last question here. So as Senator Parent mentioned previously, 20, eight states and the District of Columbia have already implemented their own EITC. So Georgia is behind. Um, Georgia always, always brags about how we are number one for business and supporting um, small businesses, but the numbers just don't support that. Um, in 2013, the federal EITC delivered $2.93 billion to a broad swath of working Georgians and an average value of $2,700 per recipient. Um, as we can see, establishing a state EITC would be putting money directly in the pockets of those small business owners and stimulating our local economies. How impactful do you all think a state EITC will be to local and regional economies in the next five years? Hmm. Uh, I, I can start. I will put it this way. Uh, again, I'll make it local. I mentioned earlier that my district is a state opportunity, and it's actually a federal uh, opportunity zone as well. It is a new market tax credit zone. And yet we have a lot of businesses, including a lot of small businesses that could be here, that it makes a lot of sense to be here, but they don't want to do so because there are a number of, I'll call it sort of infrastructural pieces that aren't there. One of those certainly is that they're, they're concerned about labor, attracting labor, retaining labor. So you can put all of the these job tax credits all you want and measure it by the amount of jobs that you have. That's something that 
larger businesses are able to avail themselves of, but smaller businesses aren't, not only because they will create, as virtue of being a small business, fewer of those jobs, but also because they have to deal more with those infrastructural pieces in order to be able to run, labor being absolutely key to those. So to the extent that an EITC will help address that, and for all of the reasons we've mentioned in the last 35 minutes, it will, then it will absolutely help those small businesses in ways that existing programs, tax credits, et cetera, haven't been able to do so because they're missing the sort of holistic element of what it takes to run a small business. anyone else like to make any comments on that question? Before we well, move? I'll just, you know, one thing I've been thinking a lot about um, with, you know, sort of this call to cut off expanded unemployment benefits that were in the federal code or uh, federal program due to COVID is that it really strikes me how, in, how and this is a theme that we've sort of been touching on and, and running has been running through this conversation, but probably hasn't been said quite this starkly. It really struck me as part of that whole conversation, how much our economy is set up to thrive essentially on poverty and people being forced to work for basically nothing um, or not nothing, but, uh, but not, not um, a sustainable wage not a living wage, even when they're working full time and even when they're working in big co American companies. And that's really um, just, it, it, to, it, to me, it's uh, really more than regrettable. It's really an abomination. And that really is not at all how it should be. And the fact that we have policymakers Wanting workers to be in that situation shows how much work we have to do to really educate um, our policymakers on um, the way that the economics of American workers and families, what those economics really are. And there seems to be, it's a part of it arises from a desire to support business, which we, you know, we already touched upon earlier, but how that ends up being big business. Um, and really, you know, some from globalization, but it just comes down to this notion that everyone needs to understand that we don't, we should not want, and there is no benefit from the American economy running off poverty. That really the reverse is gonna be true. That if we understand that there's gonna be sliding level of economic um, status among Americans, you know, like I don't see any anyone getting, I don't see any huge movement towards, you know, making sure everyone has the exact same amount of money nor what I think really support that this juncture. But one thing that I would say is it is it should be completely unacceptable to have families where people are working full time, sometimes even working two and three jobs, not be able to support themselves. That should be something that we all should be able to agree is completely unacceptable and unnecessary. And in fact, bad for America's people, businesses, health, and, and ultimately our economy. And so this is something that we can do that will be a small step towards rectifying some of those issues. Thank you, Senator. Let's see. And Danny, I know that the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute recently did some polling on how the American Rescue Plan funds should be allocated, especially in Georgia. Um, and EITC provides targeted and meaningful benefits and could be implemented as a direct payment to avoid running afoul of the uh, guidelines in the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, would it be beneficial using those dollars from the American Rescue Plan to create a state level EITC in Georgia? Absolutely. And so, you know, that the polling that we did shows that a, a strong majority of Georgians support using those dollars as a direct payment. 
uh, which, which is, as, as you said, completely allowed under the American Rescue Plan. Uh, we'll, we'll bring in over $4.6 billion. And right now, uh, the, the state does not have much of a plan to use those funds. We were originally looking at three committees, uh, two of those for broadband and water and sewer infrastructure. Now it looks like uh, the U.S. House will soon pass a major infrastructure bill that's going to send us funding to do uh, those two things. So we need to be doing more uh, for economic relief uh, and, and, and also more to, to address the effects of the, the state's response, which has been to cut the budget. It hasn't been to extend, you know, to, to the pandemic, our primary response has been to cut back funding for education and healthcare. Uh, and, and to other crucial state agencies. It hasn't been to send economic aid to Georgians uh, to pass anything like an EITC uh, that'll benefit those that are struggling. We have actually cut from programs uh, that would otherwise help folks. And so it is urgent that, that we start uh, trying to address those gaps that we have helped create on the state level uh, with real economic relief. And then I'll just say, because of that surplus, uh, because of sort of some of the unorthodox things that we have done to, to push our budget backwards in, in, instead of to grow, uh, we actually do have room to implement an EITC. You know, for, for all that we're talking about, uh, the bill that Senator Parent and Representative Lim have introduced would cost about $300 million a year. Uh, and, and, and that's the amount that goes directly to Georgians. Um, you know, to put that in perspective, uh, when we lowered the top rate of the state income tax, from 6% to 5.75%, uh, that cost over $500 million uh, a year to do that. And so, um, you know, and, and, and we're talking about $10 billion of largely special interest tax breaks that the state offers every year. So uh, this, this is really just a fraction of that. And, and that shows just kind of how much room that we could have uh, to, to try to rebalance some of these policies uh, in, in a really meaningful way that would help uh, most Georgians get ahead. So uh, absolutely public support is there. Uh, Georgians want the state to do more uh, and, and we absolutely have the resources to do that now. Thank you, Danny. Any other comments before we end our roundtable discussion? I see a question in the uh, chat, Rachel. Oh, let me see. Um, I do not, oh, here we go, Q&A. Let's see, although um, Representative Lim alluded to this, how does this affect ethnicity, especially in areas with high levels, such as along Jimmy Carter, Buford Corridor, Whitfield County, and Southern Georgia? Thank you, Juan. This, we know that BIPOC or minority uh, folks are those who traditionally have been most socioeconomically disaffected. And that is why I continue to mention statistics from my district. One statistic I haven't mentioned is House District 99 is over 85% BIPOC or minorities and over 50% of us are foreign born immigrants, again, myself included. And we are not unique necessarily. Uh, I mentioned agriculture earlier and think of the agricultural workers um, who, and think particularly of the documented ones who file income taxes or the do income taxes throughout Georgia, whether down in Osceola or up in Gainesville, these are the folks that have been most disaffected. And a lot of them have had to continue working even during the pandemic. Again, th something like the EITC and the EITC would help these people uh, continue to be in, in the workforce, not only for themselves, because I think of it foremost from a humanitarian perspective, but think of it from the perspective again of those businesses who now more than ever have realized when some of those folks left the labor market, how important those workers are. They truly are the backbone of our economy, particularly our small businesses who again, can't necessarily afford to pay the highest wages um, which is kind of an indictment on those who can afford to pay it, but don't, but I digress here. So all of that is to say the EITC would absolutely help these people in my district, in other places throughout Georgia and across all of these industries on whom, uh, for whom these workers, uh, we depend on the most for our economy. Thank Very you. well said. Yeah, thank you, Representative Lamb. 
Well, everyone, um, this concludes our moderated discussion for today. I would like to thank Senator Parent, Representative Lim, and Danny Canzo for joining us today to discuss this pertinent issue. Um, thank you all to the attendees for attending this roundtable discussion, and do stay tuned for more events from Small Business Majority and the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute as we continue to provide information on equitable policies that uplift and benefit all Georgians. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.